Good morning, everyone. It's June 10th, 2021, and we're here for part of uh, for the New Possibilities Hour with Richard Calkins, Dick Calkins. This is part of the Will Work for Food project founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan in the spring of 2020, in the height of the pandemic and lockdown, a project that Natalie initiated to bring meaning to our lives and education to mediators, arbitrators, and lawyers around the world. There's no charge for these great webinars. Rather, we ask people to contribute to a food bank if they like what they see. And our audiences have been so incredibly generous. Natalie, one of my favorite parts of the program every week, would you please inform us of the running total, how much our generous audiences have contributed to food banks so far? And Natalie, now you have to unmute. Those are the words that will be put on my tombstone, I promise you, unbelievable. Well, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. As Jeff said, our industry has been incredibly generous and we really appreciate little donations, big donations. And if you can't donate money, we really appreciate knowing that you just donate some time, maybe just volunteer and help out at your local food bank. That works for us just as well. And we love when you let us know that you've done so. And those individuals that have let us know that they've done that now have added to our total. So the new total is 116,103 dollars. Thank you all so very much. Wow, that is fantastic. And today Dick is going to be urging people if they're in a position to contribute to contribute to the Food Bank of Iowa, where, uh, where Dick lives and he'll have a few more words about that soon. Let me give Dick the introdu introduction that he deserves. Very distinguished. Richard M. Calkins attended Dartmouth College and Northwestern University Law School. He graduated college in 1953 and law school in 1959. He, in law school, he was on the Law Review Board and graduated <coughs> Order of the Coif. From 1959 to 1961, he was law clerk to Judge Elmer J. Schnackenberg on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in Chicago. In 1961, he joined the Chicago law firm of Chadwell, Keck, Kaiser, Ruggles, and McLaren, where he became a partner. In 1969, he founded Burdett and Calkins in Chicago. In 1980, Dick turned his attention to the academic world. He was appointed Dean of the Drake University Law School, where he served until 1988 and he's been an adjunct law professor there ever since. In 1985, Dick established the first national intercollegiate mock trial competition, now known as the American Mock Trial Association, to teach college students about the American adversarial system. About 600 teams from over 400 universities and colleges compete annually in these tournaments. In 1988, while also teaching at Drake Law School, he joined Zarli, McKee, Thamti, Voorhees, and Cease Law Firm as a partner. And in 1993, he established his own law firm, practicing primarily antitrust law. In 1995, Dick Calkins went into the full-time practice of mediation and arbitration. Since 1996, he has trained over 1,200 lawyers and 1,300 law and undergraduate students and conducted well over 2,100 mediations. In 1999, Dick established the National Intercollegi Intercollegiate Mediation Tournament for undergraduates. Next year, he established the International Law School Mediation Competition. Now it has participants from 46 countries on six continents. Dick has been president of the American Mock Trial Association, the Blackstone Inn of Court, the American Academy of ADR Attorneys, the International Academy of Dispute Resolution, and has held many other fantastic uh, honorable titles. He's gonna be talking to us about mediation, making the practice of law even more notable. We urge you, if you're in a position to do so, to contribute to the Food Bank of Iowa, and Natalie will be kind enough to post the link to the Food Bank of Iowa in the chat. Our, to our friend Dick Calkins, welcome. We're delighted to have you with us to tell us a little about Food Bank of Iowa and to hear your presentation. Dick, the floor is yours. 
Jeff, thank you so very, very much. That's so kind of you. Hello, everybody. Gosh, when I listen to all that, I must be pretty old. And I'll tell you, you know when you're old, when, when 70 seems like a young person. Uh, and also people say to you, my gosh, you look good for someone your age. So that's where I am. And, uh, and it's, it's a joy now to be able to, to teach and, and uh, participate in mediation. Uh, and I, I enjoy it that's so much. And Jeff, that was so kind of you to list to all those things. Uh, it makes me wonder where, how fast the time goes by. Um, I was asked, you know, come up with some questions uh, as to uh, what, what we might ask you. And so one of the things I put down was, uh, what's the difference between mediation and arbitration? And Jeff said, no, no, no. <laughs> These are all seasoned meteors. I, but you know, there is a difference between mediation and arbitration from the meteor's perspective. And the point I would like, the first point I would like to make is when you have a party or a, a, a client who uh, is using you in mediation quite a bit, and they ask you, would you do an arbitration for us? You want to be extremely cautious. Uh, just had an experience, and I didn't, but uh, someone who uh, had that situation, very, very valuable per, a party that was given uh, mediations and said, we have a big problem here. And uh, <clears throat> so he said, well, of course, I'll be your arbitrator. And he came back with a, an arbitration award against his client of $800,000. And he never got another case in mediation or arbitration from that client. The warning is, and the first lesson I want to, to, to stress here is, uh, be careful, because you'll always be asked to do arbitrations, but be careful when you do it, because every adverse and every arbitration you have, there's going to be an adverse party, and they may never use you again, either for arbitration or mediation. Uh, to, be, to do the arbitrations, I think it, it takes a very, very special skill to be able to do arbitration and survive. Because once they figure out how you lean, because you have natural prejudices, okay, you've got to uh, you've got you've got to uh, uh, be cautious. Uh, and you, we have you know we all have med arb. Uh, that is another problem because once uh, you 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 rule adversely for a party that maybe was giving you some mediations, you not only will not get another arbitration from them, but you may not but you may lose their mediations. So I make that first point, uh, minor point. I would hope, though, I could give you some ideas that may be, uh, may be new, may be worth considering. I'm going to talk about the, using the polygraph test in mediations. I'm going to talk about the domino effect in mediation, how you use the domino effect. I'm going to talk about how you use pillow talk in mediations uh, and the use of venting in mediations. And I know many of you and most of you probably have used these techniques. But, uh, and, and also, I want to talk to you about uh, how you can mediate when a case is uh, before a judge on summary judgment or the case is in appeal in the courts. You can still mediate and have a successful outcome. And we'll talk about that. And as we go along, if anyone has any questions or would like to raise any point, please uh, uh, do so because it, it, would, it would make make it easier for me. Uh, as we all know, in mediation, and it's something we're all very much aware of, there are, uh, uh, I always call it a, 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 media, a, a litigation IQ. There are certain parties in mediations that are not favored, they're unfavored parties. And I always look to see if any of the persons involved in the mediation I'm doing, whether they fall into that category. For example, lawyers, are just favored whether they're on the plain side or defense side. Uh, doctors, if, if they're on the defense side in a malpractice case, they're going to win. They usually win. But if they're on the plaintiff side and they're suing their, 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 their medical group or whatever, or the hospital, and they disclose what their salary is, they become an unfavorable party. Police officers do very poorly in mediations. Uh, banks and officers have problems as mediators, uh, as parties. Large corporations, we're aware of, insurance companies, brokers and brokers' houses, 
these are all parties that are not going to be favored in front of uh, front of a jury. Uh, truckers are not favored. And in Iowa and in the in Midwest, we have farmers and farmers, believe it or not, uh, are not uh, favorable for a plaintiff. They normally will lean towards a defendant. They think plaintiff, that farmers have to be independent, take care of themselves. Don't look to the government. So there are some disfavored parties. So one of the points I make to you is you want to be aware of who the parties are, whether they are disfavored or maybe they're favored. Uh, Another point that I would make, let me, let me talk about the polygraph test. I wish, I wish I could ask you how many of you have used the polygraph test in a mediation. Could you just kind of wave your hand if you... No, you Elliot, you say no, or you have? Okay. Uh, never, ever, ever. I don't have the equipment, nor do I have the courage. <laughs> Well, you don't have to give the polygraph test. You use the polygraph test. Let me talk about the polygraph test. I've used it and it's very, very successful. It really is. When you have, you use it in two situations. One is where the parties are saying opposite things and one has to be lying. One has to be prevaricating. They both can't be telling the truth. And, uh, and, and the case, how the case comes out depends on who's telling the truth. What you do, what you will do then is ask, will you take a polygraph test? And invariably, the person who is telling the truth will immediately say, yes, of course, I'll take the polygraph test. The defendant, more times than not, will hesitate. They'll have to think about it. And most times, they will come up with an excuse that uh, polygraph tests are not uh, reliable, they can't be used uh, in evidence, uh, I'm nervous, I don't believe in, they'll come up with some excuse not to take the polygraph test. And, and, uh, and so they, they generally would refuse to take it before the test is even given. Um, let me give you an example. This was a case where a, a woman was hired as chief financial officer of this uh, corporation, a small corporation, but very, very successful. The C CEO in, the co in that corporation, uh, when they went on business trips, wanted to have an affair. And she felt she had to do this in order to keep her job. So she consented and, uh, a, uh, uh, and then finally she decided this was affecting her marriage and she wanted to stop it. And he wouldn't, he kept insisting. So she took a constructive discharge and uh, brought a lawsuit for, uh, for harassment, uh, sexual harassment. And um, as the case was developed in the opening session, I remember the lawyer on the, on the plaintiff side actually stood up and was presenting his opening statement in the, uh, in the mediation. And he was explaining that uh, this case was a very, very serious and that uh, the damages were, they were asking for $800,000 for this. And, um, and then finally he finished and sat down and the, the attorney on the other side was sitting there and he said, you know, we agree with everything that you have said, except for one thing. This affair began long before she was ever hired. It was consensual from the beginning. <clears throat> and I remember the, <laughs> the defense, the plaintiff attorney, he stood up, he said, that is a lie. I will not stand for that. And he grabbed his, his client and they left. Uh, fortunately, we're at his office. So he just went down to his office. The, the uh, defense uh, attorney said, well, what do we do now? I said, well, offer them a polygraph test. Now, when you do this, uh, you, don't, I did not, you don't mention it in front of a client but he, sitting there. So we talked, we went out in the hall, and I, I said, why don't you offer a polygraph test? I said, how does that work? Well, we'll offer them both. And, and generally, what's going to happen is one of them will refuse to take it. So we went back in and they asked the defendant and the defense says, yes, I'll take it. No, no problem, I'll take it. So I went down to the office, the plaintiff's office, the attorney's office, and explained what we proposed to do. And, and you know, he, he believed his client and he said, well, of course, uh, I'll ask her, she'll, she'll take it. So she came in and he explained that we can take the polygraph test. And she said, well, I'll take it. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> this was unusual, usually the one who's lying 
uh, is not going to take it. So now I have two consents. So I uh, said, all right. So we set it up. We had a one, the operator was hired and he was going to take one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And the night before, we got an email from one of them saying that they were nervous and they were not feeling well and they could not take the polygraph test. And guess who it was? How many say the man? How many say the woman? You're right. She wouldn't take it. The lawyer then, her lawyer then said, look it, uh, I'm not gonna let you perjure yourself on the, on the witness stand. And you, you get this case settled. And if you don't get this settled, you're gonna have to get another attorney because I will not let you go forward like this. So there was one example. The other example of when you use the polygraph test is when you're trying to establish credibility. <clears throat> this is a case and I've done I've had about a thousand cases, not individual cases, but a thousand victims of cleric sexual abuse. Uh, and it's tragic. And I, I imagine many of you have done sexual these, uh, these cleric abuse cases and they're, they're just tragic and uh, the consequences and the lifelong consequences. Uh, and they're very, very serious. Well, this case was probably the worst case I ever heard. And I've got to be a little bit delicate as to how I explain it. It was a case where a family, uh, they were African-American family. Uh, they were, there were, were six children and the cleric, and it's relevant. I, I don't mean to, to in any way discriminate or have any problems of sensitivity. The cleric was Caucasian and uh, he was alleged to abuse each of the three boys and three girls, all six of them. And it was a very, very serious case. If, if it ever had, uh, if we hadn't gotten it settled, it would have been a very, very serious case for the church. Uh, about two weeks before we were going to start our mediation, oh, and one of the, one of the girls the, was 14 years old. Uh, she became pregnant, and the child that was born had obvious Caucasian features. So everyone assumed that the cleric was the father. So it's getting pretty serious. About three weeks, two weeks before the um, mediation, they did a DNA test on the cleric, and they found out he was not the father. And therefore, they assumed the whole thing was a setup and they were not going to pay very much money. The lawyer said, what the heaven's name do we do? Well, we've got to show credibility. So let's offer polygraph tests to each one of the children. Well, they were all adults by now. And uh, uh, he agreed. One of them was in jail. One of the boys, the oldest boy was in jail and could not be tested. One of the young one of the girls uh, had was bipolar and she couldn't be tested, but the other four could be tested. Uh, one, one young, one of the men, one of the boys, one of the men and two of the girls, they took the test and they asked all the right questions. And I'm not gonna go into what, what took place, but it was, it was terrible, gross. It was just beyond imagination. And, um, he, uh, he, just for example, he had, he had the, the children having sex with each other and watching them and, and just, and that's just the beginning, it was so bad. Three of them took the test and passed. The youngest boy took the test and it came out inconclusive, which means he couldn't pass, but that gave credibility to the other three. So the church then knew they were in deep trouble on this one and the case settled for multi-millions of dollars. So I give those two examples as to how you can use the polygraph test. Very successful. Most often it's never given because the party who can't pass is gonna find a reason for not taking the test or the lawyer is gonna resist because it's not admissible in, in the courtroom. But we're not using it for the courtroom, we're using it for mediation.
Um, any questions on that? Going on then. Uh, another technique is the domino technique uh, in mediation. And, and that involves when you have several defendants and one of the defendants is holding out, trying to get what they want. And if they don't get what they want, then they're not going to uh, cooperate, hold up the settlement. And how do you handle that? And maybe you've done this. You, uh, instead of uh, uh, capitulating to that, the one who's holding out, just go forward with doing the, uh, with what the, those that want to cooperate. Go ahead and do uh, mediate those. Leave the party who is uh, holding up, leave them out of the case. Uh, now, uh, one of the questions that arises is, don't you have empty chairs? If the one who's holding out then goes to trial, they can point to empty chairs. And you know, it is just the opposite. No defendant wants to be left in a case alone. And they'll do everything they can to, get, to, get, uh, to make sure everyone stays in the case. And as they start settling the case, start settling and getting out of the case, they get isolated and they don't want to be left in the, in the case alone because everything that happened is going to be blamed on them. And therefore, it works just the opposite. In one case, there was a, a two a contract, it was a contractual situation with two defendants. And one of the defendants was cooperating, was willing to offer the money needed to get the case settled. The other was not trying to hold up settlement to get, with, get their way. And they just wouldn't, uh, wouldn't cooperate. So he said to the, uh, to the one that wants to get money to get done, uh, let's just go forward. Why don't you just go ahead and, and settle alone? And uh, we'll leave the other case, uh, the, the other defendant to later on. Uh, we'll worry about them later on. And so I contacted the uh, other, other defendant attorney and, he, and you have to understand, they'll be very, very upset at you. They'll think you are dividing and conquering and they're gonna blame you, but that's all right. Your job is to get the case settled. But I told him, I said, the other party wants to get this done and they are negotiating to settle separately. And he said, well, you can't do that. Well, he's, but we're, they're, they're, it's not my decision. It's, it's their decision and they're, they're, they're doing it. 30 minutes later, he called back and he said, we will up our offer. And he did offer, then he offered enough to get the case settled. As it turned out, the negotiations with the first party, they weren't gonna get it settled. But it was just the threat that they would get it settled and the other defendant would be left in the case alone and therefore get blamed for everything that occurred and could it be much worse off. So the empty chair doesn't work. The parties are more concerned about being left in the case alone. And so that is a, 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 an example of how you use the domino strategy. I hope I'm giving you things that you haven't done before, or at least some ideas, it's hard to know, uh, but, uh, Also, when you have multiple defendants, they normally want to have a global settlement. Let's get a global settlement, get a global offer from the plaintiff, and we get a global offer, a counter offer from the defendants, and they want to meet all together. So you meet all together with all, when you got multiple defendants, and, uh, 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 and you have your first caucus with multiple defendants. And you can ask them, what are the strengths of your case? Uh, versus the plaintiff, because they're common strengths that they can uh, they that they will have. I do not ask what they feel are their weaknesses or concerns, and for simple reason that maybe a concern of one of the defendants may benefit a co-defendant if they start pointing fingers at each other, which can happen in a trial. So I never ask the question, "What are your weaknesses, concern?" I leave that to later on. Then I will ask them, what do you think a jury will do? Best case, worst case? Because I use the caucus method of you know, mediation. What's the best case, worst case? And uh, I don't do it orally. I don't go around the room and say to each lawyer, 
Now, what do you think is the best case, worst case? Because what's going to happen when you have multiple defendants and the lawyers there, those lawyers are going to be competing for business because some of the other uh, adjusters sitting there, uh, maybe they can pick them up later on, and these lawyers are going to compete. Who can be the toughest? Who can be the, uh, be the stingiest as to what the offer should be? So you, you don't want to do that. You don't want to ask them orally because they compete. Lawyers compete. They're keep competing for new business. So what do you do? You ask them to write it down on a piece of paper. Don't sign it. Fold it. Give it, give it to me. And you go through it and collate it. And you say, this is the range of the best case before a jury. Here's the range of what the worst case is. And nobody, nobody can be offended. And uh, you prevent any kind of uh, uh, attempt of lawyers to get some other clients at the table. And then you go back with a, a global offer. But many times that's not going to do it. So you do have to meet separately with each of the defendants and you need to set up a schedule so that you can move it along. And if they're not going to be scheduled for a while, they can go back to their offices or do other work. And you go through individual caucuses with, with the parties. And I always go through the, ask the strengths of the part, of the, of the, uh, what are the strengths of the case that you have? What are the weaknesses or concerns that you have? What do you think a jury will do, best case, worst case? Uh, what offers, what demands have been made, and, and so on in, in, the, in the caucus. So now you can ask, uh, you've already discussed the strengths, but now you can ask in confidence, what are the weaknesses and concerns? Because the weakness, as I said, a uh, concern you have may benefit a co-defendant and you might they might start pointing fingers. But now, because it's confidential and you learn what is involved, uh, uh, the, party, the party is protected, the, law, the lawyer is protected. And then you can ask, would you tell me what you feel is the percentage of responsibility of each of your co-defendants? So you get an allocation of what each individual party feels is the percentage of responsibility of all the defendants. And you, when you collate that, you take out the, one, the percentage they give to themselves, which is always unrealistic, and you collate the others and you get a real good feel as to what is the percentage of responsibility as determined by the defendants themselves. So then when you get a new demand from the plaintiffs, you can begin talking about the percentage, the breakdown of the percentage, and no one can complain because each has participated in establishing that percentage. Another is uh, pillow talk. Uh, let me give you a case so you'll, you'll see how this came up. This was a case where a, uh, a, a little baby was given, was a, there was a diphtheria, whatever the, the, the pertussis diphtheria shot to get little children. And one child in multi-millions will have an adverse reaction and a very small percentage of them, the adverse adver reaction is, is absolutely critical, uh, devastating. And there are very few of those. And the, that happened to this little girl. She now was 16 years old and uh, she was uh, mentally uh, uh, incapacitated because of that, taking that shot the doctor had given her. And, um, uh, in fact, she slept most of the time in a fetal position and her parents loved her dearly. They, 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 she was precious in their eyes. And it was a beautiful thing, that, that kind of love. But they sued the doctor who gave the shot. And they hired a lawyer and they worked through it and they finally got a settlement of $80,000. By the time they took out the attorney's fees and costs, they ended up with about $30,000. Then they found out there was a federal statute, the National Vaccine uh, uh, Act, Compensation Act, that provided up to $2 million for children that were injured in this way. And the lawyer had missed it. So they turned around and sued the lawyer for legal malpractice. And the lawyer 
uh, he just had missed it. And so we got into mediation and the policy limits was a, were a million dollars. Ultimately, the insurance company put the million dollars on the table and the father said, we will not take it. We want, we want $2 million. And he came down to 1.5 million. He says, I will not go any further. $1.5 million or we're gonna to go to trial. And I remember an adjuster who was handling the case was uh, said to me, you know, let them pillow talk this, the husband and wife. Because the, the sense was the, the mother wanted to get this over with. She wanted to get this, this testing time over with. Uh, she just felt that she couldn't handle it. It just couldn't take any longer. And this adjuster, she said to me, let them talk about it. Let them pillow talk it. They'll talk about it night and day. And finally, she will win out. And so we said, all right, let's put this over. I said, we'll put this over till Monday. Monday morning, they called and they accepted the million dollars. It doesn't matter whether it's the man or the woman that wants to get it settled, if a member of the family wants to get it settled. And you let them talk quietly in a calm uh, uh, situation. The person who wants to get it settled is going to influence the other, and more times than not, they're going to get the case settled. Um, that raises the question when you're mediating, do you go till one o'clock in the morning and just keep, pushed, keep fighting and pushing and so on? while the iron is hot, there's certainly that philosophy and it's, it's, it's good philosophy, it works. Or do you, in a situation like this where pillow talk might take place, do you say, well, look, it's been so charged, we've made a lot of progress. Uh, we're going to, uh, uh, I think we, we, we certainly are going down the right track. Uh, let the parties think about it. Let them go home and talk about it in a quiet setting. Particularly if you sense that one of the spouses, it doesn't matter if it's the man or the woman, or a member of the family, one of the uh, kids, one of the adults, children, whatever it is, if there's someone who wants to get it settled and you let them work on the others in a quiet setting, uh, uh, invariably you can, you can get your, you'll get your resolution. Uh, just another example of pillow talk, just so you'll see exactly what I mean. This was a case where a nurse was in the birthing room and the doctor said he did not want the father in there during the birth. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and during, the, during birthing, the father did come in and the nurse was busy, so she didn't have time to try to get him out. Afterwards, the doctor took the nurse in the other room and took her by the shoulders and shook her. He says, I told you not to let him come in the room the, during the birth and something snapped in her neck. And, uh, and she was very, very angry. And, and uh, in fact, she reported the doctor and his, his the medical group fired him. He lost privileges at the hospital. Uh, he he took, took a pretty serious hit, uh, but, uh, and, but she was very, very angry. She was asking way too much, a uh, very, very large number of mon not money to punish the, uh, the doctor. Of course, you're now dealing with the insurance company, not the doctor. And uh, we just couldn't get it settled. And finally we said, well, look, uh, learned that uh, she had been divorced and had married another person. And they'd only been married for a couple of years. And he was at the, uh, at the mediation. And we sensed that her anger over the situation was affecting their marriage. I mean, it was, it just was dominating her and that he probably wanted to get this over with at all costs, no matter what. And so we, based on that, we said, look, let's put this over a week, give you a chance to talk about it. And they did talk about it. They came back and they accepted a figure that made sense and the case settled. So, that's pillow talk. What about venting? I'm sure all of you have done venting and I probably can't help you much on that or give you some suggestions on, them, on that. But venting is, is extremely important. 
many times uh, parties, lay people will, will, will think of you as judge, as a judge. And what they're saying is you're an authority figure and they're relying on you to help them resolve this difficult case that they're involved in. And, uh, and I used to say, well, I'm not a judge, I'm a mediator. And I quit saying that. If they want to call me judge, uh, let them call me judge. Because what they're saying is they wanted someone to talk to. They wanted someone to tell their story to. So you give them that opportunity. And it can be very, very, uh, uh, can be very, very successful. Uh, in one case, again, I think it helps if I illustrate the case. Uh, in one case, the uh, it was a, an abuse case, a cleric abuse case, had abused this uh, man, uh, 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 it was a pedophile, and he was an adult now. And uh, he had a, a position uh, that was doing, done extremely well. He was a, a senior vice president of one of the big uh, auto companies out in Ohio. And he flew into uh, to, uh, Iowa for the mediation. And uh, he was uh, uh, very professional, spoke very professional, wore a coat and tie, you know, spoke slowly like professional people do. And, um, and they began talking and uh, he, uh, let me stop. When we do a, a mediation involving cleric abuse, we use a different format. The normal format we use for most mediations is ask what is the strengths of the case? What are your concerns or weaknesses? What do you think a jury would do best case, worst case? What settlement discussions have you had? We'll even add the element of costs uh, in a caucus. In these cleric abuse cases, we use a very different format. We begin by having the, the, the church officials and the victim and their attorneys initially, after you get through the opening uh, statements, uh, that they talk about uh, uh, we give the, the uh, parties, the, the victims, a chance to come in and tell their story, how they've been abused and well, how the, the effect the abuse has had on them, how it's affected their lives. And it's very, very traumatic. Uh, some of these grown men will break down and cry. And, and um, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's very hard to take sometimes as, as, a, as the neutral mediator. But they vent. We give them that chance to vent. It, it can be very, very therapeutic. I'm sure those of you who have done those kind of cases are going to, I'm sure you do that. After that, the second segment of it is then we go into, without, without the, the parties, we go into uh, uh, the defenses that are available to the church and so on. And then lastly, uh, we go into money and other things that they want, what other concessions that they want. But the, uh, the venting is a very, very important part. In this instance, the man came to Des Moines, to uh, Iowa, and uh, he was in a very calm way, he was explaining how the abuse occurred and that it had been very, very difficult for him, and that, but he was very calm. And then he said, do you wanna know how angry I still am? He looked right at the bishop. And before the bishop answered, he opened his briefcase and he took out a plastic tube about so long. He took out another plastic tube about this long, attached it to one end, and then he held it and he took tape off the other end and he had a dagger. And he started leaning towards the bishop. Now that the table was wide enough, he'd have to climb on the table to reach the bishop, but we were ready to grab him but he was, he, was, he was not really threatening. He was using this to make a point how difficult this thing, had, this thing had been all his life, that had been hanging on him all his life. And uh, of course, uh, we insisted that he not travel fly back to Ohio with, with this thing in his briefcase, because that'd be a, it'd be a felony. He'd go to jail and he agreed to leave it. About a day or so later, and we got the case settled. 
about a day or so later, uh, his wife called the attorney, his plaintiff attorney, and said, you know, we don't know what happened at that mediation, but there is a, uh, John is, a, is, 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 we see something happening with John. Uh, we're not out of the woods yet, but we really feel there's a light at the end of the tunnel. We think something happened in that mediation that really has helped us and helped John. And so there you go. There, there, there's a, the, the power of venting. Don't underestimate it. It can really, can really be healing. It can be a healing message. I have next, I want to talk next about how do you mediate a case which is on, it just on some, is in summary judgment. It's before a judge on summary judgment or the case is on appeal. How do you handle that? You can still mediate and get the case settled. But what you do is you'll have alternatives. If the appellate court or the judge on summary judgment, the judge rules one way, then your settlement is X. If the judge rules a different way, then their settlement is Y. You have contingent settlement ranges depending on how the judge rules. In one case, uh, I don't want you. I don't want you to think that I've only had these, these abuse cases. But this was a case where two little girls were sexually abused by a cleric, and uh, one of them uh, had repressed memory, did not remember the abuse, but it came out later in life when she was an adult through counseling. It came out that she had been sexually abused. The other remembered the abuse, but never connected up the injuries she was suffering and the cause of it was the, was the initial abuse. The judge uh, dismissed the second case on the grounds that she had to bring a, uh, bring a lawsuit within two years of, the, of majority because she knew and remembered the abuse. The other, based on repressed memory, he did not dismiss the case, and uh, that was to go forward. So the first case was appealed to the Illinois Supreme Court, and um, the parties wanted to uh, mediate both cases. Well, how do you do that? We only have one result here. But what we decided to do was, on the question of the, the, the first, who had repressed memory, they agreed to pay her $100,000. On the second one, they agreed that if the Supreme Court reversed the case and reinstated it, they would pay her $100,000. If the court affirmed, then they would pay her $60,000. And on, on that base, and the reason why the church wanted to go forward with the appeal is because it would be precedent for a lot of other cases coming along the, the pipe. It would, uh, it would be a, lead, a leading decision. So the case was settled based on how the court ruled. Jeff, do you think we want to, do we have any questions that we want to ask? Uh, I've, that's sort of my introductory remarks. I think that's fantastic. You've covered all huge amount of uh, territory there in a very efficient manner and relatively short period of time. We have a little over 10 minutes left. And if people do have questions, why don't they let us know in the, uh, in the chat box and uh, we can either call on them to ask their question live or we can just read the questions out loud. But um, we have one question Catherine Twin asked whether you, in terms of uh, uh, mental trauma, uh, are you aware of any cases involving mediations where brain scans were used to assess trauma or perhaps whether people were telling the truth or not? No, I've never seen that. That's, that's brand new. Well, maybe that's the next frontier for you, Dick. Oh, I never, I never heard of that. <laughs> Dick, let me... Uh, okay, we have a question from uh, Ellie. Ellie, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and post your question, please? Uh, 
Yes, thank you. Uh, does the mediator's proposal fit into one of these categories that you've discussed? If you need me, well, actually, Jeff can probably explain the mediator's proposal better than I can. So. Well, I'm, uh, we have a pretty sophisticated crowd. I assume most people know what it is. Dick, what, what are your thoughts on mediator's proposals? Well, um, <clears throat> you always want to be careful uh, that you don't want to use it till the end of the mediation, till everything else has been, till you've tried. Uh, there are a lot of techniques that we go over, which I know you all have used, and, but you don't want to do it too early. Because sometimes they will say, well, now, Mr. Mediator or Mrs. Mediator, uh, what do you think this case is worth? And you don't want to fall into that trap because no matter what you say, it's, it's not going to benefit you. Because if you give a figure that the party doesn't like to hear, it's not enough because they're on the plaintiff's side. Uh, they're going to think that maybe you're not qualified. Maybe you haven't had enough experience. Or maybe you're pro-defense. If you give a figure that the defendant likes, the defendant may have the idea that, you know, the meteor likes the figure and said that they think that's what the case is worth. I haven't. There's no incentive for them to go any higher. And they may have to go higher if they want to get the case settled. So you have to be very, very careful that you don't come up with a meteor's figure too early on. I um, uh, I will wait till the end of the, I will use a lot of things. I'll use bracketing. Uh, I will use uh, uh, what if. Uh, and, and these are all techniques I know you, 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 that you've used and I won't go over them, but, and, and I'll use, but I use the meteor's figure a lot. And I try to figure out a figure not what the case is worth. Good Lord, the lawyers know better than you do what their case is worth because they know their venue. But it's a figure that is going to push both sides. You try to get a figure where both sides are not going to be very happy with it. That's the best figure you can get. If, one, if you give a figure that one likes, that's not a good figure. You've got to push both sides because, you know, it's absolutely, you've got to be absolutely neutral. You have to be absolutely impartial at, at all times. And uh, so, uh, and I can give you a case, but uh, uh, this was a case, it was a very interesting case. Um, it's the one time where I had to, well, it was a case that took place down in Charleston, South Carolina. And it was a, a sexual, it was a, a cleric abuse case. Uh, not a cleric, it was a, it was a parochial school and the gym teacher was a pedophile and molested a, eight, a seventh grade and two eighth grade boys. Two of them were brothers. And he probably was the, the one of the best trial lawyers in the Southeast. He was, he was really good at, and feared by the defense bar and went down there and, and his office was at an old carriage house that he built old from the Civil War, built off, built into his office, and he had uh, Civil War uh, swords and and the uh, flags, and uh, you you get the setting. And as we were sitting there uh, in caucus, uh, I remember this uh, this gentleman. Uh, he had a white suit on, very tall, gray hair, very distinguished looking. Uh, his name wasn't Bubba, but it was something like that. And he was at the door. He said, "Bubba, come in here." He said, sit down, Bubba. I want you to listen to Richard. We had him come all the way from Des Moines, Iowa to help us get a case settled and you can learn something. Richard, this is the Chief Justice of the, Iowa, of the South Carolina Supreme Court. I knew I was out of my league, I was in trouble. And so I thought, well, I've got built some rapport here. And uh, so eventually he left and finally, uh, and I, I don't know if you've ever had this happen. At one point, we were going along. He was asking a million dollars for each of the three boys, which was way beyond anything that a case like that would be worth. <clears throat> and he came down $500,000 from $3 million to $2,500,000. And the other side was at $100,000, went to $150,000, $200,000. And suddenly he turned on me. And he said, we have come down $500,000 and they've only gone up $50,000. He said, that is unacceptable. And he pointed at his, at his watch. He said, 
you get them to move or your history, you can get on your plane and you fly back to Des Moines. I don't want to see you again. I don't know if you ever had that happen. But he attacked me. And the thing that you do is you don't defend yourself. You don't say, uh, I mean, uh, or, you, or you don't defend the other side. I could have said, don't you think a million dollars for, and the abuse was this. He would rub the boys in a delicate area with their clothes on. That was the, the magnet, that was the, the abuse was that. Now, any abuse is, for, for children is bad. I mean, that's, I admit it. But this was, has to be at the lower end, not a million dollars. And you could have said, well, don't you think a million dollars for each of these boys is a wee bit high? Or uh, look at this, just the beginning of, the, of our, our session. Don't you think that, uh, 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 that uh, we can get some compromise here? And he said, I'll give you, I'll give you 30 minutes. 30 minutes, he pointed his finger. So what do you do? Now that was coming up early in the mediation. That doesn't follow my rule that you wait till the end of the mediation. So I thought, <clears throat> he's, not gonna, <clears throat> he's not gonna come below a million dollars for the three. The other side's not gonna go to a million dollars under any circumstances. So I took a figure of $750,000 as my meteor's figure. This is not the way you do it, but I figured that I had to do something. So I went back to Mr. Dagnew, that's not his real name. <clears throat> and I said, you know, we, we, we we're working on this and I'm gonna put a media's figure on the table. And the way I do it, I say, look, it, it's not a figure that I think this case is worth. It's a figure that I think is gonna be difficult for both sides to accept and maybe they'll reject it initially. And I, that's what I expect, because it's not what the case, I think what the case is worth. Your lawyers know better what the case is worth. And if one side accepts the figure and the other side doesn't, there'll be no disclosure. I'll keep it confidential. The other side will not know. Uh, and the key to this is, now, Mr. Dagnew, the figure I'm using, I'm gonna put on the table is $750,000. Now I'm not asking you to accept it. I'm not asking you to accept it. Will you just consider it? It's the used car salesman technique. Will you just think about it? Because the longer they think about it, the more apt they're gonna do it. So you just want them to think about it. You don't wanna, to, to, to say would you accept it is too threatening. <clears throat> Here's where body language comes in. You wanna watch how, he responds when you do that, or she responds when you do that. If they hesitate, if it's the only thing, if they look up and have to think about it, that is a very positive sign. You can almost be sure they're gonna do it. If they say no before they even get out of their mouth, then you know you've, you've got a problem. And that's what happened in this case. He hesitated, and in that hesitation, I figured that was what he was looking for. So he went to the other side, and uh, I talked to lawyers first out in the hallway. I explained what was happening. I said, oh, I don't know if that's, I don't know if you go to 750, that, that's, that's pretty high. So I went back in and I went through the same spiel. And before I could get it out of my mouth, before I get the seven out of my mouth, the, the adjuster is shaking his head, no, no way we'll go to $750,000. We won't go much above $600,000. All right. Three at six hundred thousand dollars. <throat> I said, "May I disclose this to the other side?" He said, "You can disclose to the other side if they have accepted the seven fifty. You can disclose that we'll go not much above six hundred thousand. That meant to me at that level, that meant six fifty, maybe even seven hundred. Went back, presented that to uh, Mr. Dagnew." They indicated they would not get it. And I could see him getting, starting to get red in the neck, going to really get a blow up again. They will not go much above 600,000. And he calmed down. And I realized that's, that was the range that he was looking for. And he said, if you can get him to 650,000, not a penny more, we'll do it. So went back to the other side. He said, and you don't want to say the other side said they'll go to 650. You say they rejected 
the, the, the 750 or whatever it is. Uh, but if I could get them to make an offer of 650, will you accept? He said, yes. So we had a settlement. And that's another technique. When the parties are close together and neither wants to move, neither wants to put that final figure on the table. The way to do it then is to say, look, it. if the other side, if the defendant would, would make an offer of $750,000, would you accept it in absolute confidence? Would you accept it? Yeah, we'll accept it. To the other side, if they would go, if they would, if the other side would make the offer of 750, would you accept it? Neither has made the offer, both have accepted, and you have a settlement. My time's running out. Yes, and that's a very happy note on which to end things, Dick, where you get a settlement. So con congratulations and thank you for all of these wonderful and insightful uh, techniques and approaches, everything from polygraphs to mediators proposals and everything in between. Thank you so much. We really appreciate this. Can if I make people... one pitch? Sure. We have an international academy to speak resolution which runs these mediation tournaments at the law school, college, and we're starting it at the high school level. Anyone interested in working with us to establish in the high schools uh, mediation, uh, we, we invite you. And I noticed that Elena uh, is one of, the, one of our people. Yes, yeah. hello, Dick. From, Hi there. From Greece. And she is gonna be our president. And uh, we would love to have you consider joining us. Uh, we just, uh, completed a tournament in uh, uh, out of uh, uh, Kablisi, uh, uh, Georgia, not not Georgia, U.S., but Georgia, Russia. It was a wonderful tournament. It was done online, and we need judges. So any of you that would be interested in being judges and working with us, we'd love to have you. And uh, I think if we get in touch with Ellen, she'll uh, give you more uh, more help, or, or call me, and I, I can give you more information. That's my only, that's my only pitch. What, what's a, a good email either for you or Elena, Dick, so that people can get in touch with you? I'm, I'm very happy to text the email on, on the chat for everyone. Hey, Elena, Thank why you don't so you put your, put your contact information in Absolutely. the chat? I think Thank that's a wonderful so idea. And Natalie has also just posted once again the link to Food Bank of Iowa. People are in a position to contribute to that food bank or really any other deserving food bank. Uh, they're Food insecurity is a worldwide problem, and we're, we're doing our share to help deal with that. Dick, you certainly did more than your share this morning. Well, Natalie, thank, you. thank th Dick, thank you, and to your daughter Kathy. Thanks to her as well for helping to facilitate your appearance today. Natalie, thank you for all of your tremendous leadership and founding the Will Work for Food project and doing so much to ensure its continued growth and success. It's all just wonderful. We'll see you next week. Thanks very much. With that, we are complete. <laughs>